This section is on fiber splicing. All of you guys are expert fiber technicians, so you are supposed to master the uh, splicing techniques. We are not going to show you how to splice. This would be the subject of a different type of training. We are covering in this section STC requirements in terms of how to deal with the splicing. A fiber splice is a uh, well, ultimately the, the what we are looking for is a permanent low cost and TV insertion loss. But we know that we are not in an ideal world and that actual splices introduce insertion loss and we are allowing that up to 0.15 dBs per splice. ITUT L12 recommendation. Why do we use splicing? To repair a damaged fiber cable, to join to fiber strands, to also connect termination boxes or any other optical passive component to cables by means of pigtails and have to be spliced. Important on the uh, splice protection sleeves that has to be dimensioned according to your splicing machine and your splicing methodology. How much fiber core you are exposing while peeling off the fiber buffer to do the splice. So remember to choose the proper uh, protection sleeve size. Now we are going to see how to prepare the cable for splicing. Cable preparation is uh, pretty much the same, but there are some differences between two different cases that you are going to face in the field. The end axis, where all fibers in the cable have to be spliced, and the mid-span axis, where only some fibers, eventually a fiber tube, or some fibers inside the fiber tube must be spliced at that location and the rest of them are passing through. So the tools that you need to do a proper cable preparation are listed here. And you have the drawings uh, corresponding to these uh, elements here on the left hand side. All these tools are mandatory. RMI cutters, cable slitters, buffer strippers, cutters, pliers, safety glasses, isopropyl alcohol, waves, and so on. So now we're going to see how to perform an end access cable preparation. There is a lot of literature here extracted from the guidelines. I'm going to highlight the points that you need to know to do a proper cable preparation. The first thing to do is to mark the cable at the distance that you want to expose the fibers. 3 meters is a good distance for the cable preparation. And then, all these initial steps are targeting to make the rig cord visible so that you can rip those 3 meters of cable sheath to expose the fibers. Well, you just cut a notch of the outer sheath by means of the cable slitter. Remember that you have to set the blade to penetrate 90% of the cable jacket thickness, otherwise too shallow penetration would make it difficult for you to open the cable and too deep penetration would eventually damage the fiber tubes inside and other components. So set it to 90% of the cable sheath thickness and then by moving or flexing that little cut that you have done, you will discover the tip. Locate in the tip the grip cord and then cut a notch at that point. A little notch with the pliers is enough and then by means of the round pliers round the rib cord and push it so you are stripping the three meters and then you can easily remove the outer sheath. Once you have the um, sheath removed and you can see the inner components of the cable you have to remove all the elements that you are not going to use all the support elements, uh, water blocking tapes, uh, rip cord, strength yarns, RMI shears, all those things that you don't need. Just keeping a, a little bit of the strength members for installing the cable inside the splice closure. Cut the strength member to the proper length so that you can clamp the strength member inside the closure. Eventually your cable has also void tubes, tubes that do not contain fibers and then you don't need them either, so we'll remove those as well. Now you have the color-coded buffer tubes, exposed and visible. 
measure the appropriate length of the buffer tube to be uh, cut and expose the fibers for splicing. Well, you use a specific tool for this, the uh, old coaxial cable stripper tool to remove the buffer tube. Then you have to dry and clean the fibers with isopropyl alcohol, don't use a standard alcohol, or with the appropriate wipes, and that's it for the end axis. Now we're going to see the mid-span axis cable preparation. The cable preparation is pretty much the same with the difference that we are opening the cable at mid-span. So not at the cable is a and that what needs to be done to discover the proper place where the fiber tubes have to be unwinded. The um, length to open usually required is about five meters. It depends on the uh, splice closure, so please follow the closure manufacturer instructions. The most important thing and the most important and relevant difference between the end axis and the mid-span axis is that in mid-span you are not accessing the cable end, therefore you need to find out the exact place where the loose tubes switch back in the cable structure. The loose tube fiber cables are made in a way that the loose tubes are rotating inside the cable and they change the rotation direction depending on the cable manufacturer between 60 centimeters and maybe 110 centimeters or so. So you need to discover and expose that exact point where the fiber tubes switch the rotation direction. At that point, you have the ability to unwound the interlinked fiber tubes. With one meter opening, you are most likely able to find that switchback point. The process is as follows. You adjust the cable slitter to 90% of the cable sheath thickness once the location of the splice is determined. Then we just open a little bit of cable by making a cable sheath cut and then with the cutter exposing the uh, fiber tubes cut this little notch at the rip cord position just turn the pliers around the rip cord and have a good grip push it all the way and open that meter in the cable locate the switchback point of the loose tubes as we have set so once this is located, obviously remove all the uh, material that you don't need. And from this point, measure on both sides the 2.5 meters that you need to get the 5 meter opening for the, uh, the splice enclosure. And then follow the same process as usual. Use the rip cord, expose the fibers, remove the uh, yarns, aramides, uh, binders, etc. And then unwound the fiber tubes cut the strength member at the uh, proper length when clamping the cable inside the splice closure and then expose the fibers of the fiber tube that you need by using this kind of razor removing a slot of the fiber tube enough to expose the fibers once the fibers are exposed obviously clean them up with the alcohol remove all the gel and repeat the same process with the additional buffer tubes. We are going to see now a couple of videos that are illustrating everything we have set for end axis and the mid span axis. Check the um, depth of the jacket at the end. Make a test cut about four inches up. Break the jacket and it'll be fairly hard to pull off. Now you can see here's Kevlar, a rip cord to rip back the jacket binder tape and tubes each of these tubes has fiber in it 
In order to uh, work with loose tube cable, we're going to need to open up a fairly large length of the jacket. Uh, we'll probably need about three to six feet. And the easiest way to do that is to use the rip cord. The way we do the rip cord is we take a pair of needle nose pliers, simple needle nose pliers, grab the rip cord and twist it around the jaws of the pliers. We just keep twisting. It's the old sardine can routine. And you notice it will just start going right down the jacket. If we're only doing a short distance, we can just twist it. But once we get far enough down the jacket that we have a um, hand grip, we can just grab the pliers and now we want to push it along the jacket. Don't pull out from the jacket. Push right down the jacket and we can take off all of the jacket we want. Down to the point we pull the rip cord, we take our jacket slitter again, ring the cable one more time, break the jacket at that point. Now we can go back to where we open the cable up and pull the jacket off. It helps when you're pulling the jacket off to use the um, pliers to start the, uh, the interior of the cable out of the jacket. Continue pulling the inside out until you reach the point at which you cut everything you cut the jacket and we can easily remove it. Now you see we have a large amount of Kevlar. We have to unweave this Kevlar. We can also pull it down at the end and cut it with Kevlar scissors. It's slippery so it helps to hold it and now we can slide that off the cable. We remove the binder tape cut off the binder tape and the pull cord, the rip cord. Now this particular cable has a heavy center strength member it also has two flexible plastic fillers. It's a small fiber count cable. It only has four buffer tubes with fibers in them, all color coded, and it has two buffer tubes that are unused. So we'll take a cutter and cut those off and remove those. Then we have the central strength member, which is a fiberglass rod to make it stiff. We don't need much of that. We'll use a small amount of that at the um, beginning to um, hold it in the splice closure. So we'll cut off that rod and discard that. And now all we have are some very messy buffer tubes. We'll clean those with what's called degel. Degel or uh, Hydrosol are two trade names for moistened pads that are designed to remove the uh, gel inside a cable. This is very, very efficient. It only takes a few swipes. and we can get the tubes nice and clean. You can then also use it to get it off your hands and then it helps to have some wipes around. To wipe your hands and then wipe each of the tubes to dry them off.
Now, we've dried the tubes off. We're almost halfway there. The next thing we need to do is we need to get into the tubes to get to the fibers. There's two ways of doing that. The preferred way is to use this, this tool, which is a standard small coaxial buffer stripper. Uh, it's used for cutting the jacket of coaxial cable. Uh, we use it on the buffer tubes because what we want to do is we want to twirl it around and score the tube and then we're going to break it over our finger. We don't want to, um, it, the amount that you have to twirl it depends on the uh, tension on the uh, stripper. What we want to do is score it, ideally, just snap it. Put it over your thumb, snap it, snap it the other way to break it off just to make sure that you don't harm the fibers and then pull the tube out and discard the tube. Clean the fibers. Now I know what everybody's thinking at this stage and that is that you've got to be able to use a standard stripper for this. Wire stripper. And the answer is yes, people do it. Uh, and I'll show you uh, how to do it. Uh, but uh, I want to make sure that you understand I don't like this process, I don't think it's a good idea, and it does have the potential of harming the fibers unless you're very careful. However, people do it. Nick, bend until you break, twist, pull it off. Clean the fibers. Okay, so there's three of our tubes, and we'll do it again on the fourth one. Just make sure that if you're doing this, you have it set to a fixed level so that you know what level to do it at. Score, break, twist, pull the tube off, and clean. Okay. So that's how we handle, then, a loose tube cable. Hello, my name is Ron Stanko, and this video will demonstrate loose tube cable mid-span access for splicing. Materials required. Measuring tape. China marker. Aramid shears. Diagonal cutters. Needle nose pliers, preferably with rounded edges. Cable snips. Rotary cable slitter. Fiber tube score. Hook blade razor knife. Lint free wipes. Regent grade 99% alcohol. Safety glasses and gloves. Determine the location of the cable where the splice point is to be located. Adjust the cutting depth of the rotary cable slitter to approximately 90% of the jacket thickness. Ring cut the jacket at the approximate midpoint of the intended splice location. Flex the cable slightly at the cut to complete the opening of the jacket. If necessary, adjust the cutting depth and repeat the process until the jacket or armor is completely cut through. Ring cut the jacket approximately two inches from the previous cut. Adjust the cutting depth and repeat this process until the jacket or armor is completely cut through. With a cable knife or utility razor, cut the jacket or armor longitudinally between the two ring cuts. Cut completely through the jacket. Pry the jacket open at the cut and remove the cable core. If a second armor exists, repeat the same process. Locate a rip cord below the jacket or armor at the end of the cable. There will be one or two rip cords, typically yellow, blue, orange, or red, depending on the cable type. Using air matures, cut the rip cords in the middle of the opening. Using diagonal cutters, cut a notch in both exposed ends of the jacket next to the rip cords. Using round edge needle nose pliers, grab one end of the rip cord and wrap it around the plier jaws. With the rip cord in the notch created in the previous step, continue rotating the pliers, winding the rip cord around the plier's jaws. After pulling the rip cord with this method for three to four inches, it may be more efficient to grab the pliers in a T-handle fashion with the rip cord between your fingers and then pull along the length of the cable. Continue until the rip cord has been pulled to approximately 12 inches. 
Peel back the jacket material to expose the cable core. For single rip cord cables, gently pull the cable core through the opening created by the rip cords. Do not exceed the cable's minimum bend radius. Using the aramid shears or cable snips, carefully cut the yarns covering the cable core at approximate midsection of the exposed core. Locate the switchback point of the buffer tubes. If necessary, use the rip cords to expose more of the cable core until the switchback point is revealed. Depending on the cable design, distance between switchback points can be between 24 and 41 inches. The switchback point is now the new center of the splice location. Determine the length of the cable to be stripped according to the manufacturer's recommendation for splice and termination system utilized. Measure and mark the recommended length of the cable centered around the switchback point located during the previous step. Using the final cutting depth determined previously, ring cut the jacket at the marks and flex the cable slightly to complete the opening of the jacket at both locations. If the cable has multiple jackets, they must be removed in order and repeating as necessary. Locate a rip cord below the jacket or armor and slip the cable from the ring cut to ring cut. If two rip cords exist under the jacket, repeat for the second rip cord and split the jacket. Remove the jacket material between the ring cuts to expose the cable core. For single rip cord cables, gently pull the cable core through the opening created by the rip cord. Do not exceed the cable's minimum bend radius. With air matures, cut off strength yarns, rip cords, and other materials covering the tubes, leaving about 12 inches of each from the end of the jacket. Using a cable knife or utility razor, cut the helically applied binder yards at approximately 3 inch intervals. Remove the binder yards from the cable to within 3 inches of the jacket on both ends. Make additional cuts in the binder yards if necessary. Beginning at the switchback point, carefully unwind and separate the buffer tubes from the core one at a time. Be careful not to kink the tubes during handling. If the tubes are covered with filling gel, clean them with the appropriate gel remover. If necessary, cut any remaining yarns or strings wrapped around the core of the central strength rod. It may be necessary to remove some outer coating off the strength member in order for the strength member to fit into the closure strength member bracket. Do so by using a hook blade knife and removing one to two inches of the outer coating. If the cable is armored, bond the armor of each end of the cable to an approved ground via suitable bond clamps or shield connector. To break up the fibers from the buffer tubes, use the appropriate size buffer tube shaver or slitter and follow the manufacturer's instructions. Remove fibers from the buffer tube. Use dry lint-free wipes to remove the buffer tube gel from the exposed fibers. Prepare and splice fiber per the instructions of the applicable splice equipment manufacturer. Store fiber splice in excess fiber and splice tray. We are just highlighting now on this slide what is really happening in the field here uh, within STC. You can identify the way our fiber technicians, that is you guys, operate uh, our fibers in the field. This is really disastrous. Everything that you can imagine can go wrong. You guys make it wrong. So please, please be very careful and treat these delicate components and elements with care. Use the proper setups, the handling of the fiber and components, and only use approved materials. We don't want these situations to be seen in the field we are going to see in the next section an example of how to install and operate a splice closure. Keep in mind that each manufacturer has engineered and designed the splice closures in a different way. So you have to fully follow their instructions. What you're going to see here is just an example. On your screens, you have what a fiber optic splice closure is made for and what are the minimum requirements that we are looking for while we approve these passive components for STC. A splice closure is nothing else than a case to protect the splices. That's the main function. So what are the minimum requirements? The minimal requirements are shown here. The sheath retention, so that the cable sheet is properly retained and make 
the cable be fixed in a way that at least more than 400 newtons are required to pull the cable out. This is ensuring that cable and enclosure act as a single piece of equipment that removes all the tensile stress that may come from the cable during installation. Then the central member clamping is helping out on the same function by mechanically fixing it to the closure clamp. That prevents any cable movement inside the closure as we said before. The splice closures provide an appropriate loose tube routing to facilitate the splicing. Then the closure must ensure that there is adequate room for these loose tubes and fibers to be properly routed. All that must be respecting the minimum bending radius a mast across all fiber optic elements. We are also paying attention to crushing loads. The crushing loads are coming basically from the clamping mechanisms, uh, the fiber tubes clamping and fixation. If they are too tight, the fibers can be crushed inside. And then the bonding of the metallic components. In case we are using metallic cables, and these cables have to have ground continuity. So in relation to the uh, previous slide, what are the main components facilitating the features that we have seen before? There are basically four main components. The uh, cable entrance and anchoring mechanism is using different solutions depending on the splice closure, heat shrink, gel sealing, grommets, there is many different cable entrance mechanisms that ensure a watertight sealing. The cable sheath and strength members retention mechanism form the anchoring system that is, as we said before, providing this a tight physical connection between the cables and the splice closure. <clears throat> Another main component is the loose tube storage area where the tubes not spliced are stored, organized in a way that they don't disturb the access to the uh, rest of the closure elements. The fiber splice organizers themselves. There are two different organizers. The ones called single element can only splice fibers for a given loose tube in the same tray, and the single secret engineered to allow mixing fibers from different tubes to be spliced onto the same tray. So the last component is the proper splice tray, where the fibers to be spliced, as well as the splice themselves, are accommodated and protected. The excess fiber slack is stored as well in these fiber trays that can accommodate between 6 and 48 splices. 12 and 24 are the most common splice trays and the ones that are used by STC. The 48 splices can only be accommodated in what we call double strip position, which is two splices, one on top of each other, in each splice groove. Remember to always read the manufacturer requirements for cable and fiber installation, routing and operation inside the splice closures, with particular emphasis on the cable strip lengths, the amount and arrangement of slack loops, tubes and fibers, the entry and attachment of cables inside the closure, the anchoring of tubes and the mechanism to anchor these, remember, do not over tighten them. The splice trays and how they are organized and structured, the numbering and the management of fibers and tubes. The following video illustrates how a cable is terminated on a splice closure. Hello, I'm going to show you how to install a loose tube cable into the end cap of an SCF closure. We're going to be using one of the draw ports. I got a couple of tools here. I'll call out each as I use it. I got my safety glasses and some gloves. To start, we're going to open up the end port using a hacksaw. You can also use um, a straight blade. With my safety gear on, I'm using a hacksaw to open up the draw port on this closure end cap
I'm going to use my straight blade to smooth off the edges and again always whenever you're using sharp objects exercise caution thread a compression screw through the cable and use the provided gauge tool to check the diameter of the cable my cable falls in diameter D but it's less than diameter D so I have to use the medium size ceiling grommet insert the tooth washer on the ceiling grommet and insert the hole into the drop board insert the locking nut in place use the provider tool to screw it in place stop when it's tight next thread the cable through the drop port insert the compression screw into the drop port and screw it in If your cable is not completely in, pull it in so that you have room to work. Place the hose clamp over the cable and place the strain relief bracket next to it. Get the hose clamp started and use the 216B tool to tighten it. Notice the orientation of the tensioning body to the screw. The distance from the end of the hose clamp to the end of the sheath should be three quarters of an inch. Also bend the hose clamp a little bit. Make sure everything is tight, but not enough to crush the, the tubes. Use a pair of diagonal cutting pliers to trim the central strength member. And use a restraint cap a washer and a locking nut to secure the center strength member between the two. Use the 216B tool to secure everything. should look like that when done. If you have yarn in your cable, wrap it around the threaded stud and use a second washer and lock nut to secure it. Wrap everything in tape to keep the sharp edges from the buffer tubes. Pull the cable back and align the screw with the channel and use a screwdriver to tighten the screw. Now your cable is properly strain relieved. One last item remains, you have to tighten the compression screw using the provided tool. And you can hear the clicking sound. Keep doing this until that stops or until the compression screw will not move anymore. Uh -huh. That's in properly. After that, just use the provided strap, keep everything in place, and that's it. One more time follow each manufacturer instructions. The flash testing is available in some supply scratchers, not all of them. Flash testing is a way to verify that the closure has properly been sealed and therefore is isolated from the harsh environment as it should be. It makes use of a valve provided within the closure by the manufacturer, of course, and then we inject inside the closure pressurized air up to around 0.5 bar 
and apply soapy water around to see if there is any bubbles coming out so that indicates there is an issue with the sealing once done and if perfectly sealed release the compressed air and install the box we're going to show you guys a video for this welcome to the preform line products feature focus for flash testing procedures flash testing is the procedure that we highly recommend to ensure that you've assembled and sealed the closure properly before you leave the job site. Many companies have their own procedures for flash testing, so follow your company practices, but this is just one alternative way to flash test to achieve the same result. The application requires a source for pressurized air, a pressure gauge, a soap water solution, and in this case it's in a spray bottle, a can wrench, and an F valve. And that's for the Coyote stainless splice case. Air valves are built into all Coyote fiber optic closures that require flash testing, including the Coyote Dome series of closures and the Coyote Inline Runt series of closures, just to name a few. To flash test, simply inject pressurized air into the closure until the desired amount is achieved. Confirm the amount of pressure with the pressure check gauge. Using a soap and water solution from either a spray bottle or a canister, Apply the solution to all the sealed surfaces of the closure. Visually inspect. If there are no bubbles present, the closure has been successfully assembled. If bubbles are present, this indicates the closure has not been sealed properly. Identify the location, take corrective actions, and repeat the flash testing process. For all fiber optic closures, release the pressure and reinstall the valve cap. That's all there is to flash or soap testing your closure. And please remember, the job is not complete until you've flash tested the closure. Not all STC closures come equipped with the flash test valves. If they are, it's also a nice way of ensuring that the closure is properly sealed. Last slide about splice closures is the proper installation in the handholds. As a general statement, always follow the manufacturer's installation manual. Also on how to install the closure itself inside a handhold or a manhole. The position of the closure has to be fixed by the design. Any kind of deviations must be validated with STC inspection team. A uh, branch cable joining a main cable must also be looped for maintenance purposes. The branch cables crossing from one side to the other has to be preferably fixed above the dock faces below if there is not enough space. Protections may be installed in some specific cases over vulnerable splash closures or cables. Placement location of the closure will be at the top of the racking, not buried below the cables, uh, supported by the bracket installed in a handhold for that purpose. In case of congested manholes, if there is no place for clamping the slack as prescribed, place the slack loop behind the cable support. So those are some general rules that you must follow while installing the splash closures in the handholds. Again, there are many more rules in the Fiber Implementation Guidelines document, so we invite you to read them all and apply them in the field.